done. Folks, we are in the war room today talking women's boxing with my experts. Melissa Smith, she is a women's boxing historian and Mr. Eddie Goldman. We we got women's boxing. We got the, <laughs> I think it was, it should be called UFC boxing <laughs> with, Ty, with Tyson yes. Fury and that Ngano fight. So we were going to talk about that too. But, in, but first, let's talk about the historic uh, fight with Queen Serrano. I call her Queen Serrano now. Uh, Melissa, give us your uh, insight, baby. Let's yeah. Go. So, so Amanda Serrano, who you know, we for those who may not recall, is the undisputed featherweight champion. That means she holds the WBA, WBO, IBF, and WBC belts. She won uh, in February uh, again in, in an extraordinary fight against Erica Cruz on on uh, February fourth, twenty twenty three. So earlier this year. That fight, they threw almost a thousand punches a piece wow. in ten rounds. Wow. Okay, ten by two. Right. Uh, it was an extraordinary battle. Uh, one that you know was really concerning because those women were fighting, fighting for it all, and they both are champions, and they both really want it. Serrano pre uh, prevailed. She was supposed to then fight Katie Taylor in the homecoming fight in the spring. The, uh, she, due to an injury that did not happen, she took some time. Who got she injured? She then fought uh, Who Heather injured? Hardy. Hmm? Who got injured? Oh, Amanda Serrano had an injury and postponed the uh, fight with the the Taylor Serrano two okay. fight. Okay. And that's the fight that then Taylor fought Chantel Cameron and P.S. lost. Although it was that super feather of super lightweight, so. Taylor is still the undisputed champ at lightweight. Right. Anyway, all of that happened. So then Serrano uh, agreed to fight Heather Hardy, uh, which I think we talked about on the show. That was uh, a barn burner for, for Hardy, certainly, who at 41 literally left everything she had in the ring. Uh, a very emotional fight, for I think, for both women because it was a way for Amanda Serrano to say thank you to Heather Hardy for all the help that Hardy had been earlier in her career, even agreeing to put her WBA uh, championship belt on the line in 2018, a fight she had every reason to believe she would lose. But anyway, it was a tough, tough fight at Madison right. Square Garden. Um, then uh, shortly after that fight, Serrano announced through uh, her uh, most valuable promotions folks that she was going to be fighting her next defense against Danila Ramos, who was her WBO uh, uh, mandatory challenger. Not only was she going to be fighting her, but she was going to be fighting using 12 three minute rounds, just like the boys. That's right. Uh, now this was at the Carib Royal or uh, Hotel in, in a casino in Orlando, Florida, and there had to be a lot of things that were put into place before this could happen. The IBF, the uh, WBA, and the WBO all agree that she could fight a twelve by twelve by three, and they brought that to the state of Florida to their boxing commission. Florida signed off. So she had three of her four belts on the line when she wow. fought. She also happens to have the IBO. IBO also agreed that is not considered one of the four major sanctioning bodies, but it is a world sanctioning body. WBC uh, said no. And the reason they said no is that they have very consistently been very clear that they do not support women fighting more than 10 rounds by two. Wow. They feel that it is not safe. And in research they have accumulated, albeit not necessarily related to boxing, because there's very little that's really on the record for boxing, that women are more susceptible in other sports to concussions. And on that basis, they uh, have been very clear that they will not support 10, 12 by three. We will see what happens after this. So walking into that fight, 12 by three, that is not to say that women haven't fought 12 by three before. They have. 
Most famously, Layla McCarter fought Melissa Hernandez in Las Vegas, also for title fights. Two, uh, that was two title fights. That was a, a unification, but it wasn't a major sanctioning body. It was GBU and something else. Right. But so it's not like women haven't fought 12 by three. They have. Women have fought 15 by three in the late 70s, early 80s, in the 90s. I mean, when, when, when boxing was 15 by three, women fought 15 by three for championships. But it was all kind of under the radar in the sense that the states, even though they were giving permission for boxing and they were sort of keeping to the two minute rule, you could get permission to fight more than that. And women have fought 15 by three. Women have fought 12 by three. Cora Weber, who is one of the pioneers in boxing, she fought 15 by three. So this is not the first time. So let's right. disabuse everyone. What makes this historic is that in the four belt sanctioning era, it's the first unification of those belts in a 12 by three. Okay. So that's a little bit of history. So it's not that women never fought 12-3. They have. They have many times. They fought 15-3. But in this era that we're currently in, um, it's the first time that you had three unified belts on the line and you fought 12 by 3. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, that fight, and uh, she fought Daniela, uh, Daniela Ramos, who was 12-2 uh, and two coming into the fight. She's uh, older than a man. I think Amanda's about 35. Danila yeah. Ramos from Brazil, but fights out of Argentina. She fights out of Buenos Aires. She's 38, so she's no spring chicken. Um, she has not had, as I said, a, a very huge uh, career as a pro or as an amateur on the high level. So she came in without a lot of rounds, but she was definitely uh, an experienced boxer who it's not like she came in with no skills at all. Right. She actually had pretty good skills. Um, and um, they fought a very intense battle that saw Serrano throw over 1,100 punches. So she threw a lot over well, That's one hell of a three. production. That's an incredible production, more than wow. men. Okay. Danila threw a lot as well. They both threw a tremendous volume. So we're we're so if you look at Erica Cruz, remember Serrano fought through almost a thousand punches in ten by two. She did the same a little wow. more production in twelve by three. So it was a very intense fight. She got the win on all the cards um, straight through um, and. Uh, there was, you know, Ramos didn't win a round on the cards, nor should she have because she just wasn't at the same caliber. But the one thing that was interesting is that Serrano did not knock her out, which, you know, a lot of folks were saying, well, justification for 12-3 is, well, if you go to 12-3, you get the knockouts. Now, Serrano is a special case because coming into this fight with her record of, um, uh, 46 and or 45 and two coming into the fight she already has 30 knockouts she's tied you know she's too short of the record to tie the record which is christy martin who had 32 knockouts but serrano hasn't had a ko uh since uh i think 2021 she fought danila romina bermudez in puerto rico and gained a KO win in the ninth round. But oh. since then, she hasn't had a KO. So I think there was a, a sense that, oh, if she's in this 12 by three and she's with Danila Ramos, she'll get a KO win. She got the UD win, absolutely earned. Was this her best fight? Probably not, but it was, uh, and I'm going to put it down to nerves and a lot of other things. Oh. Um, but it was certainly a fight she she made outside of the ring long before she ever walked into the ring. She was determined to be the change. She was determined to be to put everything she had on the line for the twelve by three, and she executed you know a a, a really her her typical game, 
really beautiful movement, really nice punching, beautiful hooks, and everything else. She stalked her prey through 12 rounds. You know, if you looked at round one and you looked at round 10, it was the same fight. Um, and prove the point, women can not only fight for 36 minutes, but right. rack up 1,100 punches with a really high percentage. I think it was a 28 percentage of landing or something like that. It's very considered very good. Right. So a, a really superb outing in the sense of putting the marker down. What's interesting is what's happened since then. Certainly there's a lot of appreciation for her for having done this. You know, she's gone and said, listen, the rest of my career, I want to fight at three minutes. We'll, we'll, we'll put the WBC aside for now, whether she agrees to a two minute, a 10 two to maintain her undisputed status or whether she says, oh, screw it. I don't need it. I already have it. Oh. We'll see what she determines she wants to do. So wait, does that mean she gives up, she vacates the WBC bill? If she did. If she doesn't defend it. She if she might. doesn't defend it in a year or meet the mandatory okay. requirements. Yeah. And then, and at this point and, and subsequent to the fight, WBC has doubled down and said, no, a triple down, quadruple down. No, 10 by two, 10 by two. We don't see that it's safe. So, but it has provoked interesting conversations on what is safety. I mean, is it safe to fight 12? Is it safe for anybody to fight 12-3? Should we bring men down to 10 too? You know, what? where, where right. are we really? Do we really give a shit about the safety of boxers in the ring? Right. And as I said, it's provoked some interesting conversations among fighters, among people in the game to say, yeah, we never look at safety. We mismatch all the time. And where there's zero regulation, I mean, look, when you're in a fight, you have the ref, you have your corner, you have doctors to keep a boxer safe. Even then, boxers are very injured or die in the ring. Let's let's not forget that. And and that happens in a 12-3. It happened in a 3-3 and an amateur fight two years ago. OK, so these things can happen. Um, but presumably with all these eyes on a fight day, you're, you're stopping fights. You're ensuring that there's medical, that, that somebody has eyes on you to stop a fight. That's mm -hmm. not to say that it's always successful because it is not. And we know that. Mm -hmm. And it's the same for men and women. There may be fewer instances among women, but it doesn't mean there aren't. There are. We had a death in the ring a year ago from a Mexican fighter. The thing where there's zero regulation or eyes or anything is what happens before you get into the ring. Yeah. And and this is one of the questions because, you know, part of what causes brain injury, as an example, or tra tra traumatic brain injuries, aside from getting your head knocked around, is also if you are, for instance, dehydrated, you will have a greater mm -hmm. chance to suffer more serious consequences from getting knocked in the head, as an example. Now, what happens before a fight? Fighters are cutting weight. How do they cut weight? They they drink they a dehydrate. thimble full of water, okay? And if you've got a fighter who's going from, you know, was walking around at 160 pounds and they're coming down to 126, as an example, and they're practically expired at the weigh-in, they're fighting, what, 24 yeah. hours later? How are they yeah, going to get and, and it's just an awful process on the body, that whole dehydration exactly. process. Exactly. Yeah. So that, that's one thing. The second thing is boxers spar all the time. Now, for instance, uh, let's look at Heather Hardy. Preparing for her fight with Serrano, who she knows is the hardest hitting fighter she's ever fought. She fought 12 three-minute rounds. She fought boys. She fought South Four boys who beat her up every day. She was in the, she sparked. That, that's what they were there for. So she could get used to being hit. Now, the thing with sparring is it's not regulated. There's nobody checking you out afterwards to see if you didn't have a brain injury. See if you're not walking around with a light concussion. 
And what happens is you have these injuries that occur during sparring. And and then you have a week off because you stopped sparring a week, before, presumably, unless you're called for a fight a week, you know, three days before a fight. You have stopped sparring a week. And all you're doing is some, you know, aerobics and light workout and pad work. And then you come in for the fight and you're all ready to go. You've had a week since you've been hit in the head. Da, da, da. But did you tell anybody about your headache? Did you tell anybody right. about your dizziness when you get up? No. And you still fight. And even though, so you got all these people there, but in the third round you go down and you're not getting up. And it's like, but I hardly hit her. And that's what's called the second impact. Because exactly. you already got a traumatic brain injury and you just need a tap. You don't even need to get hit. You just need to jostle your brain a little and you're going to go down and you're going to end up in the hospital with a brain bleed or worse or death. So this it's a, it's a conversation in the sense of saying, hey, women and men should fight equivalent. There's no reason not. There's no physical reason. There's no, you know, it's not like uh, uh, an MMA. You fight either three, five or five. Five, five, men and women, doesn't matter. But the larger conversation, in my estimation, needs to be about safety of fighters so they can live another, literally live another day to entertain us in a boxing match. Because that's what it is. It's entertainment. Right. And and what are the things that we need to look at in terms of the governance and safety of boxers preparing for their fights? There is literally nothing. Yeah, they wear a headgear. That's that's it. But they're also cutting weight. They're doing it in a sauna suit. You know, I mean, go into any dang gym and watch fighters preparing for a fight, and they're in a sauna suit because they're dropping weight. Yeah. That's Jerry, why I like Jerry, dealing with heavyweights because they didn't have to worry about dropping. I don't give a shit. There, there, there are two different. They're related, but there are two different questions regarding safety. And one of them has to do with 12 three-minute rounds versus 10 two-minute rounds. And I think what the uh, Serrano fight with Ramos showed is that, well, obviously Serrano dominated. She threw roughly the same amount of punches that she had thrown in 10-2. And she's fighting 80% more. 36 minutes instead of 20 minutes. This fight, you know, with Ramos uh, went the distance. And what it, what changed was the pace of the fight. A lot of women's fights you see from the opening bell, they just become all-out brawls, winging punches all over the place and really are, are less artistic to watch th than this one. This one, I think Serrano had a much better uh, showcase for her skills and really a, a classic style that, that's sometimes lacking, even in some of the title fights that we've seen, in, re particularly recently in, in women's boxing. So the, the, the argument about safety, I mean, again, there's very little sample size in this. I don't I don't know that it makes a whole lot of difference in terms of this. There are there are criticisms that uh what Serrano did in the fight, she could have uh, cut off the ring better. And if she had cut off the ring better, she might have been able to go to the body and the head and uh, perhaps get uh, a knockdown or a knockout. Who you know, who knows? So she was she was chasing Ramos around around the ring a lot a lot of this fight. But I, again, I don't know that whether it was 10-2 or 12-3 would have made a whole lot of difference. The other yeah. thing about the safety and, and the training is is a general question. But that's true whether it's 10-2 or 12-3. Or that is the point, if it's, yes. If it's not, if there is, if the, the gyms and the, and the managers and the trainers and the fighters, everyone has to take responsibility for that. There's there's a debate about weigh-ins, about when should the weigh-ins be, and a lot of boxing people like the fact that there are weigh-ins the day before the fight. So you know, really, sometimes about thirty hours before the fight, 
which gives the fighters a long time to rehydrate. And this was an issue that came up in college wrestling a number of years ago, about, I think it was about 15 years ago or so, where they had a day before weigh-ins, and one year, three top college wrestlers, people who had been state champions in high school, three of them died from big colleges. Mm. And so they changed it so that the weigh-ins were just something like two hours before the matches. Now, there are people in boxing that say, well, you could do that for wrestling, but but boxing is different. Uh, I've never really been a big uh, fan of that of that argument. I think it should really be looked at and researched because then what you'd have is fighters moving up in weight to a weight that's more natural for them and they wouldn't really have to lose much weight when you know they wouldn't have to cut 20 30 exactly. pounds or whatever to get down and and these Ooh. are these are athletes that are in the prime of their life in tremendous career top fi- top physical specimens l- losing losing some weight and a lot of the weight they're losing it's not people who or generally, anyway, who are obese, who are losing weight and need to lose the weight. These are people with a very small percentage of body fat. And what they're losing could be uh, muscle mass and water. So it's very dangerous mm-hmm. for them to do that. Yes. And then, then some of them will secretly or unsecretly rehydrate right before the fight, which is, I don't think it's supposed to happen, but, you know... I think it does happen a lot, so I think that has to be addressed. But I think that I think that two the two issues have to be considered somewhat separately in terms of the the length of the of the rounds. And I found th- this fight more pleasing to watch than a lot of other top fights because it wasn't just two fighters standing there toe to toe, winging punches at each other. We know Serrano generally fights with a with a high punch output and we saw that again here here too uh but i don't know that uh, i just think if this had been 10 10 rounds two minutes a piece i just think the pace would have been more frenetic and you seen this roughly the same amount of punches all right well look speak before we move on to the heavyweight discussion uh, Melissa, have we gotten any word on what's going on with the WC, uh, WBC and Alicia Bumgarner? No, I mean, uh, WBO, uh, I think there was a piece in that, that was came out this week about a letter that the WBO sent to Baumgartner and her, and her uh, managers or whatever, and her team. Uh-huh. Now they have 30 days to show cause, essentially. Um, now, what does that mean? You know, they have 30 days to sh- to to show that she wasn't, uh, that she's clean. Oh, she has to defend herself and give she has justification. To defend herself. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, she has, she's got to defend herself and uh, she's got a month to do it. And we'll see whether there's any extensions offered or anything else. But there's nothing much that's come out after that. And the idea there is uh, if, if there's no response or if it's not satisfactory, then they'll go to the next step, which is uh, potentially to strip her of her title and, and a suspension. impose a suspension. Now, she is technically suspended across the United States by the ABA in all jurisdictions in the state, but in the United States, but that does not preclude her from fighting outside in the United States. And there are no suspensions that I know of from any of the other sanctioning bodies. I did pose a question to WBC. I haven't heard a response yet on uh, the status of their investigation of this matter. Uh, the article that was written last that came out last week made mention of the fact that the mission, you know, the, the folks in Michigan have been absent on this. Apparently, I, I believe that the person that was the head of their group their head is no longer working there so who knows what the status is but it's now july it's now november this happened in july and we're nowhere and i gotta tell you hannah gabriel's 
Hannah Gabriel's had a positive test prior to her bout with Clarissa Shields. And she was canceled from the fight, but she still can box. She's still a champion two times over. I don't get it. Oh, my goodness. To Michigan Michigan has, Michigan's Michigan done commission. nothing, but the sanctioning bodies on on paper have done nothing. Because if they've investigated, there's nothing, no reporting at all on the status of that. They, and in terms they of this, they have to wait legally because the Michigan but the Commission is bodies, the governing committee. But yeah, now but the, the sanctioning WBO, bodies can do it. They right can now, go. the WBO listed yeah. its regulations. They said they were all waiting for Michigan, and that commission seems to be missing an action. Yep, which is a long, that has a long history of being a terrible commission, and they were trying to revive boxing in Michigan with the Clarissa Shields fight at Little Caesars Arena and all the big hoopla around that, yeah, and yeah, the Alicia yeah, Baumgartner yeah. coming, and the Michigan commission screwed it up. In, in both cases. So the WBO is taking it into their own hands because they want their sanctioning fees. They want this belt defended, They whether it's Baumgartner or whether it's sure declared vacant and they have somebody else fight for it. So they're, they're starting to do this, but the other commissions aren't. So you have this sort of stalemate situation. But again, relying on these, these idiotic commissions that we have. Yep, yep. They should have known that the long history of the Michigan Commission's terrible decisions, one after another, hometown decisions. This is one of the worst commissions. And yeah, Detroit is, is a big sports town. There are a lot of boxing fans there, long history, the Cronk Gym, all that in, in Detroit. But if you're, you're, you're regulatory body is a joke. They're going to end up screwing it up. So what? who's going to want to go back to Michigan now to put on a big fight? It's just, it's disgraceful. It is absolutely disgraceful. And, uh, and, and you know, with all eyes on this, she's an undisputed champion, for God's sake. Where the hell are these people? It's absolutely disgraceful. And, and you know, fine. If, if it turns out it's incorrect and all the rest, there, there's some error then that should come out. But the longer this goes with nothing happening, the longer right. you realize, no, she's caught, you know, her A test is positive. Likely her B test is positive and get, do what you're supposed to do and move on. Right. Absolutely disgraceful. I do know that, you know, and, and it's not just Baumgartner. You, you, you've got Christina Linodatu, who was her opponent who lost. You got her team involved. You got all of these different actions that have to happen the you know the fight needs to be if, if indeed it is it is found that she was uh, she had doped prior to this fight the fight itself needs to be uh, you know a dq and, and so Leonard Datu can go forward yeah, it, the would be, it would be a no know, decision if they find or no decision doped. whatever it, right that's what i meant in nd but th those things need to happen so that we can move on. You've got an right. entire weight class, super feather that's zero right now because you've got the undisputed champion is sitting there suspended from fighting in the United States for doping and nothing happens. It's ridiculous. It's like, it, you know, lack of transparency. They're delaying. No governance at all. No governance at all. It Zero. is another shit stain on boxing. I mean, it is it's just. It's like, we really yeah. need this shit. We've got enough. We got Showtime going out of business. We got all this crap happening. Oh, exactly. More, 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 more. More right. garbage. We got all this garbage in the Saudi The end Arabia. is near. <laughs> the end you know, is near. <laughs> it's like, it's hard to fucking enough. And then you got this shit. Right. That's and just like crazy. holier than thou. Oh, I was fine. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's positive. What? Right. Talking all that shit. That's right. Well. Oh, your B test was negative. Well, I, I didn't see it. Where did you publish that? Yeah, because those break. findings would have come out. If that B test was negative, that would have been blasting all oh, That would have been over. blasting all over. Exactly. See, I told come you. See, now. I told you. Right, right. Pushing lights. Give me a break. Okay, oh. All right. Look, Eddie, uh, let's go, let's talk about the UFC boxing event that happened. <laughs> <laughs> over 
it gets from going from Baumgartner to this, it gets <laughs> right. they stay right. it gets more ridiculous. It, 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 it gets, gets stupid. It gets right. worse and worse. Worser and worse. And worse <laughs> and worse. Oh I'm just God. gonna because I, I wrote an article on my Patreon right after the fight with Tyson Fury and Francis and Gano, and I was really pissed off. And I'm just gonna read the first uh paragraph or two. Great article, this. by the way. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Excellent, my, fabulous. My, my friend Folks. Charles Farrell really liked it. He said it's like the definitive article. <laughs> on this. Of course, it could have been two or three times longer analyzing right. the fight itself. But I just want to give give an idea because this fight has been dis- the fight itself has been analyzed and discussed to death. But just to give this to give you an idea, and I wish I wish there was like some really good actors, some Shakespearean actor or somebody <laughs> could read this better than than I can. But I'll <clears throat> I'll, I'll I'll try my best and. It's called Boxing Would Be Better Off Without Tyson Fury. And, and by the way, if I wanted to get more street, I would have used a couple four-letter words in there. The like October the 28th <laughs> 20 boxing match in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, between boxing's top heavyweight, Tyson Fury, and former UFC heavyweight champion, Francis Ngannou, was supposed to be an easy fight a stay busy fight, a showcase for Fury. It was supposed to be a money grab for the undefeated Fury from the Saudi monarchs who were eager to boost their tourism, sports, and entertainment sectors. It was supposed to be a mere appetizer to stimulate interest in a long-delayed heavyweight title unification fight between WBC champ Fury and WBA IBF WBO champ Alexander Usyk, which would quickly follow also in Saudi Arabia. It was supposed to be a farce, a circus fight, a clown show against an MMA fighter in Ghana who had exactly zero professional or amateur boxing experience. Instead, the joke was on Tyson Fury and also most of us for thinking that he would take this fight even half seriously. And then I talk about him coming in at the heaviest, heaviest of his career. Oh. Fury claimed that he trained for the 12 weeks. I, I don't know. What was he doing? Lifting Big Macs <laughs> all day or something? He was yeah. lifting hamburgers. <laughs> you know, it was just the bangers and mash or something in the UK. <laughs> He 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 was at the press conference on September 7th, about seven weeks before, supposedly five weeks into this training. And there's a picture of him po- with his out without his shirt on posing with Ngano. And I said that at the press that press conference, he looked even heavier with a flab filled midsection that easily <laughs> could have been the before photo in a diet ad. Right. <laughs> Oh Lordy, then, that is cruel. And, and then, oh my lord! Then Eddie. we saw. Then, then we saw the fight, and I'll just you know quickly. The first two rounds, not a lot happened, but Fury won. The third round, he was knocked down by a counter left hook from Engano. There's a picture that Top Rank put out. By the way, the picture that they they usually send press pictures out of people to use the one they sent a fury on on the canvas was horrible had like it looked something was right in the middle obscuring the view i can't believe they didn't have a better shot than that i've i've feeling they didn't want that one but people reproduced other pictures but there's a picture they did send out of the two of them squaring off when Ingano was in a south force stance if you look at that picture aside from looking at Fury's love handles. Ngannou had a proper stance as a south <laughs> against the orthodox fight of Fury, and Ngannou's right foot was outside the left foot of Fury, which is what a south fighter has to do when you have the two stances. Get your foot on the outside. This is a guy in his first professional boxing match doing this. 
against the supposedly top heavyweight fighter. And then the fight went on, and Ngano seemed to fade and get tired. I don't think he was used to fighting. This was a 10-round fight, fighting all, all this long. And, of course, no wrestling. You can, With the wrestling and grappling, and from what I read in Ngano's last fight in the UFC, he wasn't doing that well after the first three rounds. So he wrestled the guy in the last two rounds, and he ended up winning a decision. You can the, the breathing, the resting is a lot different uh, than, than when you're boxing. Right. But the fight went on, and the last two rounds, next to nothing happened. I gave them to Fury to give him a, a close decision, but there was no urgency on Fury's part. Is you know it was it's just so so absolutely terrible. This is not a robbery at all. The 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 the, the best scores would have been uh, Fury winning either ninety six ninety three or ninety five ninety four. But I couldn't argue with giving it to Ngano ninety five ninety four. Well, you know it was it was a close horrible fight. But the decision, the split decision for Fury, was not a robbery. We've all seen robberies where somebody dominates and wins three quarters of more of the rounds, and and the other fighter gets gets the decision. But this was an absolute disgrace on Fury's part. He obviously didn't take this guy seriously. He wasn't in shape because he he just couldn't step things up. He fought just to avoid getting knocked down or knocked out again. And it, it was is really bad for boxing, and it tremendously raised the stock of Francis Ngano in the combat sports world, a guy who wasn't given a chance by, by anybody. And I already documented a little bit how Fury, that he's already been a long disgrace in boxing, is a little bit of what I wrote. He has a long history of bigoted and ignorant comments about black people, women, Jews and LGBTQ people, this alone would have had him suspended for a long period in almost every other sport after a lengthy and absurd delay by British anti-doping authorities. In 2017, he was suspended for two years for using PEDs, although when they announced the suspension, the time had elapsed. You talk about UK anti-doping and all kinds of crazy things. And He's been refused access to the U.S. by being prevented from boarding a flight from the U.K. because of his long association with fugitive mob boss Daniel Kinahan, who was wanted internationally for being the head of the Kinahan Organized Crime Group. And there's still a $5 million reward on Kinahan's head from the U.S. government for his Uh arrest. Or conviction, which unfortunately has not taken place. And this is who Saudi Arabia brought in to to showcase against Ngano. And I he just he, he he's only fought, if you can call it that, one time this year, this fight against Ngano. In twenty twenty two he had two relatively easy fight against fighters that are shot, Dillian White and Derek Chisora. And now the fight with Usyk, again, they say it'll happen in 2024. So we go another year without a fight for an undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. And instead, he's he's doing his so-called reality show on Netflix. Maybe he'll return to the, the fake wrestling. Who knows? And, and I think this is in line. I just want to – I'll probably write this up more in detail, but I just want to give an idea – of how boxing's popularity and marketability has, has really been destroyed over the years while this con man continues to say all of his stuff and go on social media and all of these things. There's an annual list put out by Sports Pro Media of the 50 most marketable athletes in the world, not, not boxing, not combat sports, everything, tennis, Football, basketball, baseball, all all of this. And it started in 2010. And every year that they put this out, through 2022, there have been boxers on it. And I'll just give 
some of the people that Manny Pacquiao was on it in the early 2010s for, for many years. Anthony Joshua started to appear on it. And in 2017, Anthony Joshua was ranked the number one most marketable athlete in the world, not boxer, athlete wow. of any sport. In 2018, he dropped to number two, but he's still up there. And this, you know, has people like Messi and Djokovic and all these these people that are on it. In more recent years, I'll just go the last couple of years. 2020, they put Ryan Garcia is number 12, which is only appearance on the list. Joshua dropped to 31 and Fury was 32. In 2021, Canelo, who had been on the list before, was ranked number four in the world. But then we know when he lost to Bivol, that kind of punctured his balloon. In 2022, there was only one boxer that got on the list, Katie Taylor. She wow. was number 47 in the world. By the way, she was not the first woman boxer on the list. In 2012, Mary Com, the amateur champion, was number 38 in the world on there. And and she since, I think she's retired now. I don't know if she's planning a comeback, but for her, her amateur uh, wins, you know, what is it, like six amateur world championships? Yeah, the she, list, she was in, and she was a bronze medalist in the first uh, right, Olympics in, in 2020, 2012. So yeah, yeah. she was at the end of her career when they started the, these lists of fighting. 2023 list just came out a couple of weeks ago. In the top 50, there are exactly zero boxers oh. on this list for the first time since they started this back in 2010. Wow. That is crazy. Can Can Canelo is on this list. They have an expanded list of, I think, 125 athletes. Canelo barely makes it into the top 125 at 116. Damn. This is just an example. All Terrible. these, I see all these idiots and propagandists and liars saying this is 2023 has been such a great year for boxing. Oh, yeah, we, we lost Showtime. Nobody gives a shit about boxing anymore. You know who I think are the two most popular boxers in the world today in Katie November Taylor. 2023? Yeah, no, this, this is sad. Francis Ngannou and Jake Paul. Oh, my Lord. They, well, yeah, in Jake terms Paul. of popularity, they what? They Jake are the two. Yeah. They get the Biggest, they get the biggest numbers. They get the biggest media attention. They oh, get the biggest God. social media attention. It's over. And, and in real <laughs> fights, and and Jake Paul had all these fights against wrestlers and stuff. If you count Jake Paul's one fight against the pro boxer Tommy Fury, who is just a novice and not you know more like a club fighter, and Engano's fight against Fury, both these guys are. Zero and one against pro fighters that can be considered real, not just anyone that they fought for money, but that is a professional fighter by, by that is a boxer by profession. That's, that's where we're at today. They've destroyed the infrastructure. So There's been this corruption. Every week it's something else. The situation with Baumgartner and the drugs, it's one mess after another. And I've been saying this, and I, I, I d don't like doing this. This is not why I'm covering these sports to basically write their obituaries. But this is a story that's out there. This is the absolute reality. And Fury doesn't seem to want to train and box at a high level anymore. So let him retire. Let him do something else. If he wants to roll around with WWE guys or whatever the hell else he's going to do and do a TV show. Let him do all that stuff. Get the hell out of boxing if you're not going to fight the top boxers. Open, open this thing up. But in the heavyweight division, I don't know who the next generation of, of stars are, really. There will, there will be somebody. You just from, said it. <laughs> yeah, mediocre lot who can get, get some of these get some of these belts and we could go over some of those names, but who's really going to 
grab people's attention. In 2017, when Anthony Joshua fought Vladimir Klitschko for the heavyweight championship, the unified heavyweight championship in in Wembley, and got all this is the, the height of his popularity. In the UK, that was on Sky Sports box office. And a few years later, Sky Sports dropped boxing. They brought in boxer, which are not not as high level cards that they've had. In the US, that fight was on both HBO and Showtime. As I recall, it was live on HBO since it was in the UK. It showed in, in the night night there. So that was the uh, late, late afternoon in the U.S. It was shown live on HBO and rerun at, at night and primetime on Showtime. Both HBO and Showtime by the end of this year are now out of boxing with, with no replacement. That's just an example of that. And Joshua, we know the troubles in his career, has lost popularity. Klitschko is long since retired. He's in Ukraine fighting uh, the country's uh, in freedom from Russia. And who's replaced them on the top level? Canelo is still very popular, but that's more of a North American phenomenon in, in the U.S. and Mexico, where he, he does remain very popular. Who Who is there? And the top women's boxers, Clarissa Shields, Amanda Serrano, and others, are all going to fight in MMA, mainly the, the PFL, because there's there's still so little money in in women's boxing. the uh, the Cameron right. the Cameron Taylor rematch that Melissa would probably know better. But I that's again in three arena, right? The small arena. Yeah, yeah. Like it's ten thousand. Yeah, in, in Dublin, it's 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 in the three arena. That's correct. Yeah, I mean so, there are still issues in Ireland. The security is still. A big issue. It's and a there, mess. You, you know, look, you've got some really great female fighters, right? You got your Costa Valley who fought last night, you know, that's setting up for an undisputed battle with Sinisa Estrada. Terrific opportunity. But, you know, the best place to fight, to have that fight is not in the United States. It's in Costa Rica because that's where she'll fill a stadium of 50,000 people. Wow. Because you coast of Ali has that kind of popularity You're in her own country. She'll build a stadium. She built stuff last night. It was crazy. She was the main event, which it's a golden boy card. It was shown on on uh, uh, the zone and has tremendous popularity. But other than that, you know, you've got the zone and, and boxer are still promoting a lot of women. Um, in, in, in England, thank God for them because there's nothing here, zero, okay? Lou DiBella is still really trying to showcase women. He's got a card tomorrow night. It'll have women in it. There was an all, there was a card in, in Texas last night with uh, Stephanie Hahn who won her bout. There were three female bouts on the card. Did anybody hear of it? No, why? It's not shown anywhere except local. Yeah. We'll never see it. We'll hope to catch it on YouTube. So it's not like boxing isn't popular in the local markets. It is. If you look on BoxRec and see the schedule of fights in the United States in particular on any Friday or Saturday night, there's a hell of a lot of cards. A lot of fighting going on. But none of it's televised. It's all local shows. Nothing that's really percolating out. We have no regular boxing. ESPN is out of business when it comes to boxing. When was the last time there was a fight on ESPN? Even I don't know. They're uh, putting it on ESPN Plus, like the FA Jogba fight that they had. Yeah, Saturday. right. How many it. people watch that? Yeah, exactly. and the, I, I think the business model they use is what's breaking the bank, too, because you think about all the money that goes into those pressers and they got to do a presser yep, on yep. both coasts and yep. you got to feed the, you know, because I've gone to those pressers and they feed the everybody that shows up. They have to rent the space. They've got to 
It's, uh, a, it's a big it's deal. a lot so i the get, marketing well, aspect is huge and exactly without regular boxing you know when espn had regular shows when usa when you uh what is it U, usa uh yeah, yeah, the, the USA, USA had Network. Tuesday night fights. You had Friday night fights. You know, even if it were only ran six months of the year, you waited those six months so you could sit and and, and throw your throw shit at at Teddy <laughs> Atlas every Friday night. You know, and and bitch about the fact that college basketball ran late. You know, <laughs> right. again. But at least you had fights and you had good yeah, fights. Right. You know, or Showtime was regular, but now. It's just, and it's the pay Painful. the pay per view model that has killed access to right. be able to watch fighters, and yeah. it really came home to roost with the Fury and Gano fight. Even though there was a lot of publicity, a lot of media coverage, even from places that normally don't cover boxing, some numbers came out. In the U.S., it cost eighty dollars to watch the pay per view. In the oh. U.K., I had it was cheaper. It was about. 22 pounds, which is roughly 25 bucks, of give or take, depending on what the, the rate is. I don't have numbers on that. And it was shown around the world in many different countries on DAZN. But in the U.S., where Ngano is better known, the numbers came out, an estimate. And the, they don't release official numbers, but usually there's some validity. Mm. The numbers that watched on ESPN Plus... Uh, pay per view were fifty six thousand. Oh, plus, snap. that doesn't even pay for the uh, the pl broadcast. Plus, plus the other ways of getting it eleven thousand five hundred. And this That's is less is. than like, like the 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 third rate fake wrestling pay per views get. Yeah. And so this is what Saudi Arabia paid paid all this money for. And the Saudis are gonna think, you know, we invested, we knew we were gonna we we're gonna lose money on this thing, but we didn't think we'd lose this much. They have all yeah. these sports that are that are coming there that people know that are popular, or concerts or tourism, all these different things that they have and and somebody's gonna sit down and look at this just like everyone else and say, wait a minute, we know we're investing and we write it in the beginning. We'll lose money. That's that a lot of businesses do that. They have a plan to make money a little bit down the road, but they're going to say, they're going to adjust it. And they're going to say, just like Showtime did, just like HBO did, just like all these other things. Why the hell are we putting all this money into it? People want to see other things. They had a lot more people watch it when they had Jake Paul versus Tommy Fury. Well, that, and that's the thing. They thought they had a sure thing with Tyson Fury, but he didn't play ball. He came in, you know, he didn't take it seriously. If, they, it, if I were them, I'd go for the fight, reaching, though. Reach a contract, Before, before people watch the fight. No, no, I understand and, what you're saying, but I'm the, just the, saying. The, thing, the thinking was we have the boxing heavyweight champion and yeah, an MMA heavyweight champion and we'll get both audiences. The fact is what you do is you piss off both audiences because the boxing fans viewed this as a joke from day one and the MMA fans said, well, this isn't MMA and it's not in UFC. The branding is important. They're like, it's like a cult that it has oh, to be yeah. in UFC. And even so, even the MMA fans didn't expect Ngannou to do very well. So why why would they pay all this money for this, for something that they felt they knew was going to happen? And then it ended up being stunning in some ways, but worse than people expected. Well, yeah, because, I mean, it was worse than people expected because Tyson Fury didn't, you know, essentially he's in breach of contract. You know, if I were his, I'd be really pissed at him for showing up the way he showed up. Because it, you know, even if, even if they still didn't make the numbers, at least if he had put on a good show, it would have justified the investment. But he came in and he said, "Fuck you," right? He came in out of shape, overweight, and he could, like, "I don't care." Right. So he, he a screws mess. everybody. <laughs> he screws his promoter. That is he awful. screws Saudi. He screws 
everybody because he didn't come in with serious intent. He came in like a brat. And what was his purse? How much was the purse for? Billions. Tens of millions. They don't reveal again. We're dealing with Saudi Arabia. You're not going to get any transparency in any of this. I mean, the governance, out, the, quick, go- right? the governance aspect is is another is another oh. example of this thing, too. They had they wasn't announced to like a day or two before the fight that this was counted as an official boxing match on on the records of Fury and Ngannou. And they 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 brought in the British Boxing Board of Control to regulate it because Saudi Arabia has no professional boxing commission and for previous fights they had been using a a shadowy group called the middle east professional boxing commission based in dubai and what a Mm. wonderful reputation dubai has for all sorts all sorts of things they didn't even they they claimed on their social media that they work with the british boxing board of control and and the and the wbc on this fight but essentially, the regulation was done by the promoters themselves, the British Boxing Board of Control, and the WBC. I don't know what role that was was played by this by this local outfit. Not only that, but they flew in. I don't know all of boxing royalty, right? Yeah, and fed them. They had everybody there, right? Every old heavyweight that you exactly. know, you could still walk. You showed up. I, well, Tyson Fury was there legitimately because he was right. there as a trainer, but they had everybody. And, you know, the social media was just full of these photographs of older, what you know, fighters, all male. I didn't see one woman anywhere being fed, eating and drinking. I know it's Saudi Arabia, but like zero anywhere, not even a pretense of, a, of an official because they do have them. But. It just looked like a party. This was a junket. It was like a press junket, you know, and they put up a lot of money for those folks. They paid hotels and they were in five-star hotels. They had food right. and everything they wanted, plus whatever little goodie bags they left with. It was just disgraceful. The whole thing was a disgrace. That is crazy. Well, look, we, uh, you guys have anything else you want to cover before we uh, call it a day? I'm good. Oh, that's what I like to hear. Yeah, good. But look, what what fights do we have coming up uh, for women, uh, Melissa? Well, you get you know, the biggest up? is uh, uh, you know Chantel Cameron and and uh, uh, Candy Taylor. I don't have the list in front of me, so I'll, right, no, that's okay. That. We'll get it next time. We will get next it time next we'll time. Go, we'll go into a bigger thing, but yeah, that's that's probably the biggest fight coming up, and that's going to be real exciting. But you know, there's. You got people that haven't been fighting lately. You know, Clarissa hasn't done anything. Uh, you know, it's, it's tough to make these fights. We do have, oh, Shadisa Green, Shay Green, our our dear friend Shay Green is going to be fighting uh, for the WB, vacant WBC belt. All right, now. Franchon Cruz Desern. What? Oh, shit. All December. right, look, I need Shay. Uh, get it. it. Let's go. You on the Jake get, Paul lead card, me, baby, let's go. On the on the Jake Paul card, that's going to be a really yeah, good fight. Uh, that's right. You know, she she got Shay Green got the uh, got the go ahead from WBC that she was the mandatory, and um, and then Savannah Marshall uh, had an injury, so her title was put on hold for now. Oh well. Uh, and then whoever wins fights Marshall. Okay, um, right on for the WBC. To, and Marshall has the other, so she's still, you know, technically undisputed. Well, technically not undisputed anymore because WBC belts on hold. Um, but that that fight was oh, it, it was announced at the Amanda Serrano, uh, Danila okay. Ramos fight. So cool. that was kind of a nice nice thing for Shay. Nice thing for Franchon. Franchon, right? Uh, and it'll be shown on the zone. I think it's. December 15th, I want to say. So I'm kind of, I'm really looking forward to that fight because Shay certainly has earned that with her career. And all right. Uh, and well, we love Franchon. Oh, yeah, I hope they have she's a good Queen performance. Franchon to me. Right on. All right. Well, look, tell the people where they can find you now. Well, they, y'all can find me on, uh, on Shitter. 
I'm there less and less. I, I really, I can't handle it. Right. It's can't too handle it. It's hard. But I, I, I'm there. I'm still live tweeting fights. I, I live tweeted uh, some of the Ramla Ali fight last night, uh, yesterday afternoon, and I, I'm doing boxing on there. I'm really staying away from the politics. I can't, can't right. handle the responses. I can't handle the ten thousand porno queens that I keep trying to get on my site. Yeah, it's like insane. get out of here. Goodbye, goodbye. Block, block, block. It is uh, on Instagram, um, I'm uh, same thing at Girl Boxing now, and I'm trying out threads. Um, you know, there's a little bit of boxing on there, not much. Trying to build a community for women's right. boxing, just not a lot of traction, not as many people on there. And other than that, uh, books in production, the promise right. of women's boxing. Yay! Congratulations, be, uh, my friend. published in June. Um, more information to come when we get. A little further along in terms of uh you know certainly the initial the first launch party at Gleese's gym in all right very um, cool um and girl girlboxing.org is my website i haven't been writing lately and just kind of taking a break but i'm going to get back to it after that ninety thousand word project i think you deserve a break. i think i need a break <laughs> <laughs> okay all right eddie tell everybody where they can find you my brother well, still writing regularly on Patreon earlier in the show. I, right. I read some of it. You really should subscribe to it because this is independent boxing. Excuse me. Independent boxing journalism. You're not finding this uh, elsewhere. Excuse me. Mm. My voice is getting a little hoarse. Nay. <laughs> this is independent boxing journalism. You're finding propaganda and lies and idiocy on these other sites. And oh, what a great year this has been for boxing 2023 when it's it's been a disaster and a few great fights. But looking at re realistically what's happening to this, I'm covering it. I'm just telling the truth. I, I wish this weren't the case, but this is the truth. So you go to patreon.com slash Eddie Goldman. My website at eddiegoldman.com. You can also look at my uh, Twitter, which I'm still using because there's no viable alternative. A lot, a lot of it is politics and war. A lot of stuff's happening in the world, but still have to talk about combat sports. And it's at NHB News. I'm looking at Blue Skies, an alternative, but I haven't posted on there for a while because it's it's very dead over there in general but i think that's one that a lot of people are looking at as a potential alternative to twitter if and when this imbecile starts charging to use twitter which will be the death knell of it even yeah. if he's charging a dollar a year he wants to get your banking information right i'm not paying and, him nothing yeah nope. so that's gonna that's gonna be the end of it so but it's not a it's not really a suitable alternative at this point it's still in invite only and i do have a couple of invites actually left if you want you're interested in something uh something like that i just add something we didn't cover is i would look at what uh the investigative reporter jens weinreich has written he's on uh, he's on Twitter and wrote some very important, a very important article about what's happened with the Inside the Games website, which really had been the the leading website covering Olympic sports and with all the stuff that's gone on in boxing, had a tremendous amount of information. And this was exposed a couple of years ago by USA Boxing that Inside the Games was owned by a company. That was owned by, you know, one of these shell things. Um, Umar Kremlev, the, the Russian who's head of the what? now suspended IBA. <laughs> but it would still, inside inside the game still was somewhat independent for a while. Now, the original owners have sold the rest of it to the company that Kremlev has. Most of the writers have left. It's just straight up. Be it's Terrible. either just reprinting press releases oh, oh that an event was held and this is who won and or, you know just you know vanilla stuff oh, that no is real sad. analysis and even before that there was this whole issue 
I'll just briefly go into it with World Boxing, where they've been announcing more members leaving IBA and joining World Boxing. And one of them they announced was the Nigerian Boxing Federation, the first African federation to join World Boxing, which is a big step. Nigeria is the largest population in Africa. Very important move. Inside the Games published an article saying Nigerian Boxing Federation has said no, they hadn't joined a world boxing and they're staying with IBA. It was all based on a quote from one vice president of Nigerian Boxing Federation. And they kept repeating this, even though the head of that and the head of Nigeria's Olympic Committee and their, their governing body, the leading body of the Nigerian Boxing Federation, all had agreed to join world boxing and they kept inside the games kept repeating this and repeating this and repeating this and they never really tried to straighten this out and get to the get to the bottom of this and it was just propaganda and very very misleading but at the beginning of this month now that site is just a complete complete wreck there are fewer articles fewer writers unknown writers are on there so that's like a, a big loss for huge loss olympic olympic media Terrible. And Terrible there, loss. yeah there are other people to look at but i hope world boxing really enhances uh their own media getting the word out more on this so i would encourage people to follow it because it's been over many many times before Th- this is the foundation of professional boxing it's olympic boxing all, all these people we've talked about Almost all of them have very strong amateur experience. Many have been Olympians or Olympic medalists or Olympic champions. And right now, world boxing has to grow for it, boxing to remain on the program of the Olympics for LA 2028, as we've discussed before. And there's an information war going on in general with these authoritarian reactionary countries, Russia, Iran, and so many others. And boxing is, is, is part of it. So that, that's a real loss, but I would suggest subscribing to Jens Weinreich's uh, newsletter, reading what he writes. He writes both in German and English. His English is excellent. So if you don't speak German or using Google translate is, is a pain in the neck, you'll still be able to follow basically what he's doing and so uh go on that search out his site search him out on uh on twitter and we got to keep up this whole battle but uh, you know it's a, it's another little another little thorn in boxing side that's happened there so right. check all that out all right well look thank you guys for tuning in uh, i want to thank Eddie and Melissa, you guys are the leading experts here uh, at warsports.com. This is the war room. Oh, uh, oh, 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 what, Eddie? Oh, 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 it's not like Horshack. Remember when? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Ooh, ooh, late ooh, ooh. Right. <laughs> One thing I forgot our girl, Alva Johnson. Alva Johnson. Has, Alva, yeah. Has a music show. She was a big boxing fan, goes to fights and all that. She oh, wow. has a show every Thursday night at 7 Eastern for an hour on Radio Free Brooklyn. Not about boxing. It's house music. Yeah, uh, genre, that's what I'm talking really about. Good. Yeah, really good. Yeah, and, and, and it's a genre that I'm not real familiar with, but I'm learning house. a lot about it. And, and you could listen to that. It's free. Look up Radio Free Brooklyn. And you could listen free each Thursday. She generally gives us a shout out. And uh, hopefully we can be guests on her show because she can do other shows on Radio Free Brooklyn that aren't the the music shows. So check it out and follow her on Twitter also. Alva Johnson. Right. Right She's great on Twitter. Right. She is great. All right. Alva Johnson, we're giving you a big shout out out there. Uh, folks, thank you guys for tuning in to the War Room. I am your fight goddess, and this is Sports Justice Radio, and we will be back next time. You guys can check me out on Instagram. I'm still there, Fight Goddess One, and I'm still on Shitter for a minute till we can't, <laughs> till we start getting charged for that bullshit. 
Uh, and I'm at Angry Afro Radio on Shitter. So, you guys, until next time, peace, love, and push-ups. Boom. <laughs>